砥砺前行，接续奋斗，党的事业，各方面的事业取得了辉煌成就。今天，我们邀请中央纪委副书记、国家监委副主任肖培先生。中央统战部副部长许佑生先生、中央对外联络部副部长郭业洲先生、中央裁办分管日常工作的副主任韩文秀先生与大家见面，请他们结合各部门工作职能，介绍有关情况。并回答大家关心的问题。下面我们先请肖培先生介绍情况。好，我先介绍情况。同志们、朋友们、女士们、先生们，大家早晨好。我们呢即将迎来中国共产党百年华诞。一百年来，我们党一路坚守初心使命。一路英勇奋斗牺牲，团结带领全国人民，创造出彪炳史册的伟大功绩。党的百年征程，既是一部波澜壮阔的社会革命的奋斗史，也是一部积浊扬清、自我革命的斗争史。总书记说。我们党立志于中华民族千秋伟业，百年恰似风华正茂。关键在于始终坚持“党要管党，全面从严治党”。在推动社会革命的同时，进行彻底的自我革命，成为中华民族的中流砥柱。党的十八大以来。以习近平同志为核心的党中央，坚持打铁必须自身硬，把全面从严治党纳入四个全面战略布局。总书记以“我将无我，不负人民”的赤子情怀，以得罪千百人，不负十四亿的使命担当，以刀刃向内，刮骨疗毒的。坚定意志，推进党的建设的伟大工程，以优良的作风凝聚党心民心，以严明的纪律管党治党，以零容忍的态度惩治腐败，巩固了党的团结统一，扭转了四风击壁，构建起党和国家的监督体系。反腐败斗争取得压倒性胜利，并全面巩固，党在革命性锻造中更加坚强有力。从十八大结束，二零一二年的十二月，到今年的五月份，在党中央坚强领导下，纪检监察机关共立案审查调查省部级以上的领导干部。是三百九十二人，厅局级干部二点二万人，县处级干部十七余万人，乡科级干部六十一点六万人，查处落实八项规定精神不利、有严重问题的、四封问题的，是六十二点六五万起。新时代的全面从严治党的历史性成就，为实现第一个百年奋斗目标提供的强提供了强大的政治引领和坚强的政治保障。自我革命是我们党百年奋斗锤炼出的最鲜明的品格。站在两个一百年历史交汇的关节点上。纪检监察机关将用习近平新时代中国特色社会主义思想武装头脑
，强化政治监督，强化作风锤炼，强化纪律约束，强化腐败治理，围绕现代化建设的大局，发挥监督执行。监督保障执行，促进完善发展的作用，以全面从严治党的新成效，确保我们党始终成为中国社特色社会主义的坚强领导核心。谢谢大家。下面请许由生先生做介绍。好，女士们、先生们、媒体朋友们，大家好，很高兴参加今天的新闻发布会。和大家一起交流，统一战线工作。再过几天，中国共产党就将迎来百年华诞。百年来，中国共产党始终坚持和发展最广泛的统一战线，团结一切可以团结的力量，调动一切可以调动的积极因素。共同致力于为人民谋幸福、为民族谋复兴的伟大事业。统一战线已经成为中国共产党凝聚人心、汇聚力量的政治优势，是夺取革命、建设、改革事业胜利的重要法宝，是增强党的。阶级基础，扩大党的群众基础，巩固党的执政地位的重要法宝，是全面建设社会主义现代化国家、实现中华民族伟大复兴的重要法宝。党的十八大以来，以习近平同志为核心的党中央高度重视。统一战线工作，召开了一系列的重要会议，制定出台了《中国共产党统一战线工作条例》等一系列重要的法规文件，形成了习近平总书记关于加强和改进统一战线工作重要思想，为新时代统战工作提供了。根本遵循，在党中央的坚强领导下，当前我国政党关系、民族关系、宗教关系、阶层关系和海内外同胞的关系更加的和谐。统一战线呈现出团结、奋进、开拓、活跃的良好局面。已经汇聚起了海内外中华儿女同心共援中国梦的磅礴力量。好，谢谢。谢谢。下面请郭业洲先生做介绍。女士们、先生们，今年是中国共产党成立一百年，也是党的对外工作一百年。回望历史，我们可以自豪地说，党的对外工作这一百年。是促进党和国家事业发展、助力中华民族伟大复兴的一百年，是推动中国与世界关系、中国共产党与世界关系发生深刻变化的一百年，是把中国人民的根本利益同世界人民的共同利益紧密相连，不断为人类进步事业做出新贡献的一百年。一百年来，党的对外工作始终。同党和人民站在一起，始终坚持以马克思主义中国化的理论成果为指导，贯穿中国革命、建设、改革等各个历史时期的全过程。特别是党的十八大以来，习近平总书记亲自谋划、亲自推指挥、亲自参与，领导推动党的对外工作，开拓进取，奋发有为。为党和国家事业取得历史性成就、实现历史性变革做出了重要的贡献。中国共产党的国际影响力、感召力
，引领力显著提升，前所未有的走进世界政党舞台中心。习近平总书记指出，党的对外工作是党的一条重要战线，是国家总体外交的重要组成部分，是中国特色大国外交的重要体现。这是对党的对外工作百年规律和经验的科学总结，为新时代我们做好工作提供了根本遵循。自一九二一年我们党诞生以来，党的对外工作就始终是党的一条重要战线。这体现了党的对外。在工作中，我们坚持在党严党，在党卫党，在党新党，坚持贯彻党的理念。直接体现党的意志，党的对外工作是全党共同参与、协同推进的伟大事业。自一九四九年新中国成立以来，党的对外工作就始终是国家总体外交的重要组成部分，这出突出了党的对外工作的战略功能。在工作中，我们通过多层次、多形式的政党交往。发挥党际关系、对国家关系的引领、巩固、促进和兜底的作用，通过发展新型党性关系，服务构建新型国际关系。自二零一二年党的十八大召开，中国特色社会主义进入新时代，党的对外工作日益成为中国特色大国外交的重要体现。这彰显了党的对外工作的独特风范。在工作中，我们坚持发挥特色优势，突出政治引领，传承优秀传统文化。党的对外工作具有着鲜明的中国风格和中国气派。目前，我们党和世界上一百六十多个国家的五百六十多个政党和政治政治组织，保持着经常性的联系。我们的朋友遍天下。展望未来。我们将深入贯彻落实习近平新时代中国特色社会主义思想，立足三个重要的定位，统筹两个大局，围绕服务民族复兴、促进人类进步这条主线，胸怀国之大者，树牢四个意识，坚定四个自信，做到两维护。我们将把推动党的对外工作发展，同贯彻落实党中央的重大判断、重大战略、重大部署，统一起来。坚决维护党的执政安全、社会主义的制度安全，坚决捍卫国家的主权、安全和发展利益。我们将准确把握党和国家所处的外部环境和历史方位，深入研究国际形势和国际格局的变化规律，努力当好党中央的参谋助手。我们将持续的推进党的对外工作的理论和实践创新，优化工作的战略布局。和体制机制，继续推动中国共产党与世界政党高层对话会等工作平台的机制化，创新讲好中国共产党故事，助力“一带一路”高质量发展，努力服务构建新发展格局，携手各国政党，共同构建人类命运共同体，共同建设一个更加美好的世界。谢谢大家。下面请韩文秀先生做介绍。大家上午好。现在呢，我从经济社会发展角度啊，介绍一下建党百年的伟大成就和经验启示。回顾过去一个世纪的历史，中国共产党团结带领中国人民进行了前无古人、艰苦卓绝的伟大革命和建设事业，把积贫积弱、苦难深重的旧中国改造成为欣欣向荣。日益强大的社会主义新中国，使中华民族走上了伟大复兴的康庄大道。践行初心使命，为人民谋幸福，为民族谋复兴，要有雄厚的物质基础。在中国共产党领导下，中国经济实力实现了大幅跃升。新中国成立七十多年来，中国经济累计实际增长。约一百八十九倍，目前中国经济总量已经超过一百万亿元，是世界第二大经济体，占全球经济的比重提高到百分之十七以上。
。新中国成成立之初，连一辆拖拉机都造不出来。现在，我国是全世界唯一拥有。联合国产业分类分类中全部工业门类的国家。As defined by the UN, China is the largest producer of over 220 industrial products, including cars and computers. China's economic and comprehensive strength has increased significantly, promising bright prospects. For the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, under the leadership of the CPC, the Chinese people's lives have experienced sea changes. Early after the founding of the PRC, China's per capita income was only 27 U.S. dollars. When the life expectancy of 35 years old, literacy for adults was 20 percent, which means an overall majority of the population were illiterate. Infant mortality rate was as high as 200 per million. After 70 years of efforts, currently China's per capita income has exceeded 10,000 U.S. dollars, and China's life expectancy was raised to 77.3 years. Education span of people aged 15 years and above reached 9.9 years old, and、uh, infant mo mo mortality rate was lowered to 5.6 per million. Since reform and opening up, 77,、uh, 770 million rural population were lifted out of poverty, accounting for 70 percent of the global population that were lifted out of poverty. The thousand years long issue of poverty was historically resolved. China has completed the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects and are marching toward the goal of common prosperity. Over the past 100 years, the CPC has accumulated a lot of valuable experience and knowledge in leading and promoting economic and social development. We need to strengthen the party's leadership over the economy, make development the top priority of the party's governance of the country, and pursue high-quality development. We are committed to reform and opening up, to upholding and improving the. Basic socialist economic system, so that the market plays a decisive role in resource allocation and better play in the role of the government, and conduct the win-win strategy of opening up. We build a market-oriented, world-class business environment, make innovation the first driving force of development, and accelerate the building of a major country of science and technology featuring self-strengthening. We put people first in improving people's lives and keep pursuing a better life for the people. We stay committed that clean water and lush mountains are mountains of gold and silver, and、uh, follow a development path featuring prosperity, well-being, and ecological soundness. In the new era, there are new missions. We need to follow the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee, with Comrade Xi Jinping at the core, and the guidance of Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Draw strength from the century-long history of the party. Focus the new development stage. Implement the new de development philosophy and foster a new development paradigm. Pursue progress while maintaining stability, and make all-out efforts to secure new victories in. Fully building a modern socialist country. Thank you. Thank you all for the opening remarks. Now the floor is open for questions. Please identify yourselves before asking your questions. Thank you. With Xinhua News Agency. Countries are all pursuing modernization. The CPC has realized the first centenary goal and put forward the second one, that focuses on modernization. Under the CPC's leadership, what features does China's modernization have, and how to realize that? Well, let me take this question. To realize national modernization is an unremitting goal of the Chinese communists. From the moderately prosperous society to basic completion of modernization, and then to fully building a modern socialist country, this is the top-level design and strategic arrangement made by the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at the core. China's modernization has its distinctive styles,、uh, features that are the following: first. 
China's modernization features the largest population. China has 1.4 billion people who are going to be modernized as a whole. This is unprecedented in human history, and that means uh, requires a lot of efforts and means uh, more difficulties to be overcome. It will also have a major impact on the world and also con contribution to human progress. Second, China's modernization features common prosperity. Common prosperity is an essence of socialism with Chinese characteristics. We need to make the pie bigger, but also divide the pie better. In the, in the process of modernization, we need to take the initiative to address inequality among regions between rural and urban areas and on uh, income uh, distribution. We need to prevent bifurcation so that all people can benefit from modernization. Third, China's modernization features coordination of material and cultural progresses. We stay committed to the uh, core values of socialism and focus on conviction and ideal education and uh, carry forward uh, patriotism, collectivism, and uh, heroism. We aim to combine material wealth as well as the comprehensive development of humans. Fourth, China's modernization features the harmonious coexistence between man and nature. We focus on the parallel progress of development and ecological progress. We do not follow the path of uh, pollute first and treat uh, later. Instead, we opt for a new development path that features resource conservation and green and low carbon growth. We will tackle climate uh, proactively and work for carbon peaking by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060, making active contribution to all humanity. Fifth, China's modernization features peaceful development. We also, we also follow the basic norms governing international relations, including peaceful coexistence and mutual, mutually beneficial cooperation. We oppose uh, hegemonism and unilateralism and work for a community with a shared future for mankind. China's modernization is defined by prosperous, uh, democratic, culturally advanced, harmonious, and beautiful. We need to make progress in all the five fronts, which means material wealth, political progress, uh, cultural progress, social progress, and ecological progress. The China-style modernization reflects the CPC's founding mission to pursue happiness of the people and rejuvenation of the nation. It also reflects the logic governing socialist development as well as human development. We will stay committed to party leadership, recognize the new uh, development stage, stay committed to reform and open up, and conduct a systemic approach, and mobilize all forces to build, to fully build a modern socialist country. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, with People's Daily. My question is for Minister Xu. The United Front is an important treasure that enabled the CPC's victory in revolution, development, and reform, as well as achievements in the new era. What are the experiences that we have learned? Thank you for your question. In the CPC's century of extraordinary struggle, for victory, a lot of experience has been gained on the United Front, which can be summarized as the following. First, commitment to the leadership of the CPC. The CPC's leadership is the most essential feature of socialism with Chinese characteristics and the most salient feature of United Front work. It is only with the CPC that the United Front has a core to rally around. It is under the leadership of the CPC that the United Front can stride forward in the right direction. Second, commitment to the common theoretical and political foundation. The United Front holds high the banners of patriotism and socialism. 
On the mainland, socialism is the greatest consensus, and fully building a modern socialist country is the shared objective of all the Chinese people. Beyond the mainland, patriotism and supporting national reunification represent the greatest consensus. And achieving the great renewal of the Chinese nation is the shared aspiration of all the sons and daughters of the Chinese nation. Third, commitment to great solidarity and cohesion, galvanizing public support and strength, rallying all forces that could be rallied, and mobilizing all positive factors that could be mobilized to fight for the goals of the party remains the fundamental task of the United Front. Fourth, commitment to the larger interests of the work of the party and the country. The United Front will focus its combined efforts on where the party's central work is. The current priorities for the United Front are to actively promote relations between political parties, ethnic groups, religions, and social groups, and to enhance harmony among Chinese at home and abroad, to contribute to a modern socialist country in all respects and the great renewal of the Chinese nation, to help uphold and improve the socialist system with Chinese characteristics, advance state governance system and the modernization of governance capacity, to maintain social harmony and stability, safeguard the country's sovereignty, security and development interests, and to help ensure lasting prosperity and stability of Hong Kong and Macau, and work for the full reunification of the motherland. Fifth, Committed to seeking common ground while shelving differences, the United Front is where common ground and differences coexist. To expand common ground is the essential requirement of the work of the United Front. Whether differences are tolerated will have a direct bearing on the breadth and depth of the solidarity of the United Front. It is important to have the right approach to relations defined by both commonality and diversity, and to respect, uphold, and accommodate the interests of all the allied in the relations. Sixth, commitment to the general framework of the United Front work. Involved in sophisticated, wide-ranging and long-term work, the United Front has its strength in unity and coordination. It is essential to establish a general framework of united front work led by the party committee, coordinated by the United Front Department, and with relevant authorities fulfilling their respective duties, and promote high-quality work of the United Front in the new era. Thank you. Thank you with China National Radio. Many foreign political parties and leaders have congratulated on the CPC's centenary. Could you share some specific information about those congratulatory messages? How do they comment on the CPC? Thank you. Let me take this question. The centenary of the CPC has profound implications for the CPC, for the entire Chinese nation. This is a major and a joyous event. It has also captured sustained and close attention from the international community. As we approach the centenary, congratulatory messages and letters have been pouring in from across the world. Leaders of countries and the political parties have sent letters to 
General Secretary Xi Jinping to express their congratulations. And some political parties have adopted resolutions to express congratulations to the centenary of the CPC. And also in some countries, the political parties, by overcoming difference among different parties, have held gatherings dressed in red, sent joint congratulatory messages to the CPC. Also, some foreign political parties have held seminars on the occasion of the centenary of the CPC, and their congratulatory messages have been sent to us as an outcome of their seminar and discussions. So for us, these are expressions of warmth and goodwill, and some have sent not just written messages, but also videos of congratulations. By yesterday, the 27th of June, we have received more than 1,300 congratulatory letters and messages. Among these messages, more than 150 heads of state and government, more than 200 main leaders of political parties have sent such messages. And the work on this is still going on. And among these messages that we have received, and also among the daily exchanges between foreign political parties and the CPC, we can see keen attention on the work of the CPC. And for these foreign political parties, they see the work of the CPC as having five special features. First, keeping up with the times. They see that the CPC has been adapting theories to China's reality in applying Marxism, and we have established a theoretical system that keeps abreast of the times. And the second feature is to put people first and to seek the happiness of the people. Many leaders of political parties from around the world have expressed the conviction that the CPC has embarked on an extraordinary journey of sharing will and woe with the people, and the reason of our success is our commitment to seeking a happy life for our people. And for them, the third feature of the CPC is that it has kept strengthening its institutions and maintained its vigor and vitality. Full and strict party governance of the CPC demonstrates the extraordinary courage of the CPC. It has laid a solid foundation of the party's governance and has won the support of the people. And the fourth feature is the strong leadership and the combat effectiveness. They believe that our extraordinary leadership and execution power provide strong support for all undertakings in the country. And uh, this has been the key reason why the CPC has been able to go from victory to victory. And the fifth feature is our care and compassion for the world community and our global vision. They highly appreciate China's Belt and Road Initiative and uh, building a community with a shared future for mankind and other important proposals for the world. For human progress, we have provided visions and approaches and solutions that act as source of hope and confidence for the world. These messages also convey the world's expectation for the CPC at a new starting point. They believe and hope that the CPC will lead the people of China in overcoming the future risks and the challenges and achieving the second centenary goal according to the time frame and also contributing to the well-being of people around the world. They also hope that the CPC will fully respond to the concerns of developing countries and the political parties of other countries and also find more ways and channels to share the experience in party and state governance and also in having more exchanges with other political parties of the world so that the whole world can achieve fast progress in modernization and national development. They also hope that the CPC will be able to provide an exhaustible source of public good in vision and in thinking, in addressing challenges such as security, climate change, development gap, and so on and to contribute to a peaceful, safe, and prosperous world. 
And uh, we can also tell that these political parties are closely following the leader of our party and uh, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. They believe that Comrade Xi Jinping is a great Chinese leader that has emerged during the many practices of the party and uh, also he has been a world-class leader contributing important thoughts and practices to the world. They are deeply impressed by what was said by Comrade Xi Jinping, by his vision and character, including what he said about putting aside his own well-being for the well-being of the people, and also his courage for reform and the political wisdom of achieving actual results for the people and his vision and the strategic sense of what is best for his country. And he said, they say that he is the general archi chief architect of Chinese nation's rejuvenation. And also, he has been the source of new solutions and guidance for the world to respond to various challenges. And he's a leader that has brought hope for the world. Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era and the relevant practices of implementing this thought is also a key focus in the messages sent to us by the foreign political parties. This thought, they say, has guided the country towards enormous changes and achievements. It is also important worldwide. First, it opens up new vistas for the development of socialism. His important thought belongs to all countries' endeavors and the political parties that seek progress for the people and for their countries. It represents exploration efforts for a great and brighter future for the world. And second, this thought injects impetus to human progress. They believe that this thought has captured the logic between national governance and the party governance. On both fronts, this thought has proven successful and has deepened people's knowledge of the law of human development. And third, for people's modernization drive, this thought provides a new path forward. They believe that China's miracles have encouraged the developing countries. And China's path is a new option for other countries' path towards development. And fourth, for international governance, this thought points the way forward. They believe that this thought, along with the many thinking it brings along, for instance, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Community with a Shared Future for Mankind, and the new type of international relations, provides new thought and experience on international relations and kindles the dream for a better world. Me and my colleagues are working on compiling these messages and publishing those messages. When that happens, you will see the specific message on what I have been briefing you. And we can all see that General Secretary Xi Jinping is the core of the party central leadership and the party as a whole and the central pillar of our path towards rejuvenation of the nation, and he provides the fundamental guidance to our endeavors and also the leadership core of the party central committee and is closely connected to the future of the people and of our country. And according to these messages, they say that the CPC is indeed the key to having a correct understanding of China today and China in the future. So as we embark on the new historic journey, as we celebrate this centenary, indeed, we will be keenly responding to the hope and uh, expectations of the world. We will continue to tell well the story of the CPC and of the country and how the CPC has led the Chinese people in achieving the Chinese dream. And we will be helping the world better understand the CPC and what we have done for the country's reform and uh, 
modernization and to seek more sympathy and support for these endeavors. Thank you. With Itatas from Russia, I have two questions about the CPC's relations with the international community. First, what's the most important blessing of the CPC centenary to the Russian people and the people of the whole world? Second, on the Hainan Free Trade Port, in the next 100 years, what are the CPC's expectations for the Hainan Free Trade Port? Well, let me ask Minister Guo to take your question first. Well, thank you for the question. With the guidance of President Xi Jinping and President Putin, the relations between China and Russia have been cruising at a high level. The two presidents have decided to establish a comprehensive strategic partnership for coordination in the new era. The two countries are advancing the relationship between China and Russia as well as achieving important achievements for the practical cooperation. The two countries' uh, coordination in international arena have also given a strong boost to global peace stability and growth. Since COVID-19, the two presidents have maintained close strategic communication on each other's core interests. We have given each other firm support, which is a full demonstration of the high level of China-Russia relationship. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the China-Russia Treaty on Good Neighborliness and, co and Friendship. We will continue to advance the relationship with wider and deeper perspectives. Cur currently, the China-Russia Comprehensive Strategic Partnership for Coordination for a New Era have become a force for stability and uh, uh, in the international arena and also become a paradigm for state-to-state -state relations, delivering tangible benefits to the people of the two countries. Our strategic mutual trust have also reached a new level. It has become an important force for the peace and stability of the international landscape. The inter-political party exchanges are also an important part of China-Russia relations. The CPC has close relations with the uh, United Russia Com uh, Party, the Russian Communist Party, as well as other political parties that serve in the Russian National Duma. And uh, we have carried out exchanges at all levels. Let me point out the following features of our relations. That is wide coverage, high level of exchanges, uh, a, a well-developed uh, in institutional arrangement, and uh, strategic communication. This is a paradigm of uh, the interpolitical party exchanges between countries. Now we are deepening exchanges on governance of the country as well as carry out information sharing on uh, issues of shared interest. We are uh, having exchanges on the uh, development of our each other's countries. Our political parties will also hold important commemorations for the uh, for the centenary, and we will send greetings to the Russian people as well. I myself, as a representative from the party's external work, let me say that we will never forget that after the October Revolution of Russia, uh, we have received Marxism from Russia that has saved China. And in the early years of revolution, the CPC has established close uh, relationship with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The Sixth Party Congress of the CPC was the only overseas Congress that was convened by the CPC. In the early 20th century, many Communist Party members of China have been traveling to the uh, Soviet Union to study 
and they have uh, come back to contribute to China's development. During the Second World War, China and the Soviet Union have fought side by side together, making significant sacrifice for global peace. It was also a large group of Soviet experts who have come to China to found the uh, basis of China's industrial development. Standing at a new historical starting point, the CPC is rallying all Chinese people to fully build a modern socialist country. The Russian people are also securing new achievements for national development. We are glad to see stability, uh, well-being, uh, and well-being of the people of Russia. President Putin has also decided on the major strategic goals and tasks for 2030. We have full confidence in the development of Russia, and we are convinced that uh, under the leadership of President Putin, Russia will achieve its goals of national jubilation, and we wish uh, Russia even greater progress in this path of development, and we also wish happiness and tranquility of one and each and every family of Russia. During COVID-19, we also wish that all countries will work together to secure new victories against the virus and return to normalcy as early as possible. We send our best wishes to all political parties in both China, Russia, and other countries to contribute our collective efforts to the development of of the country. On the Hainan Free Trade Port, let me give the floor to Minister Han. Well, as we all know, starting from 1980, China has been setting up special economic zones like Shenzhen, and after that, we have been working to advance the open up of the coastal regions and border areas. And in 2020, we set up the Hainan Free Trade Port. This shows that China's uh, doors of open up will become even wider in the world uh, in the future. The establishment of the Free Trade Port of Hainan was personally decided by General Secretary Xi Jinping, and it is also a major milestone in the new landscape of open up of China currently. The overall plan for the development of the free trade port and the free trade port law were already adopted. The paid investment increased by four times, and uh, trading goods increased by 38.5 percent. Under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee, smooth progress has been made in the uh, Hainan Free Trade Port. It has become an important destination of investment and business operation. The key is to follow the socialism system with Chinese characteristics and uh, align with high-level trade investment uh, standards. We will focus on the institutional reform and uh, make this an important uh, component of our effort to advance opening up. The CPC Strict Committee have uh, three important roadmaps for the port. First, by 2025, we'll build a port featuring trade and investment liberalization and facilitation. Second, by 2035, the port will become a new uh, height for China's open economy. Third, by the 2050s, we will comprehensively build a high-level free trade port that has international influence. We have a lot of expectations as well as full confidence for the development of the port. Thank you. Next question. Thank you, with CCTV. In the past 100 years, the CPC has always conducted strict party discipline, particularly after the 18th Party Congress. There has been enormous achievements in this regard, and it is also widely commended by the Chinese people as well as the international community. What achievements have been made since the 18th Party Congress in terms of comprehensive party discipline? Thank you. I give the floor to Mr. Xiaopei.
ones who know themselves can excel. And this is what General Secretary Xi Jinping said at the conference marking the 80th anniversary of the Long March. To have the courage to launch self-reform and exercise full and strict party governance is a distinctive part of our party's character. Since the 18th National Party Congress, a defining feature of our governance is to have full and strict party governance. And in this endeavor, we have made historic and groundbreaking achievement, which has had all-round and lasting impact. And this has completely changed the conduct and outlook of our party. This is demonstrated in four ways. First, we have unequivocally upheld the leadership of the party and strengthened party building. At the end of the 18th National Party Congress, we are meeting the press. General Secretary Xi Jinping said that the goal of our party is to achieve a better life for the people. There are many areas in which the people are not yet fully happy with the party, so we must exercise full and strict party governance. Two years later, in December 2014, when General Secretary inspected the Jiangsu province on an island called the Shiye town, an old party member, Cui Yonghai, said to General Secretary Xi that uh, you are the enemy of corruption and uh, also who brings good news to the people and happiness to the people. By then, we have handled 83 officials in the party. And uh, General Secretary Xi Jinping said that we must exercise full and strict governance. And it was during that inspection tour that uh, this endeavor became one component of the four-pronged comprehensive strategy. And the fundamental goal of full and strict party governance is to strengthen and uphold the party's leadership and party building. This is to ensure that the party will always be the strong leadership core of building socialism with Chinese characteristics. Under the party's leadership, the entire party has been working together to fully step up to their political responsibility. And uh, this has improved the party's conduct and uh, the problem of lacking party building and uh, lax and weak party governance have been corrected. We have cemented the weakened positions of the party, and the party has gained a completely new look. And uh, in ending extreme poverty, in achieving initial prosperity, and uh, in fighting COVID, the party's flag has been flying high. Uh, we have given full play to our strengths in leadership, organization, and uh, institutions. And they have helped us secure victory after victory. And this process has demonstrated the authority and the leadership of the party as the most important backing for the cause of the people and of the country. And the second, we have firmly strengthened party building, and the political building has been put first in this endeavor. We have been upheld, upholding the authority and the centralized unified leadership of the party central committee. And uh, this is the most important and highest principle of the party. The goal is to ensure that we can fully implement the party's line, and we can ensure that the decisions of the party and the good policies benefiting the people can be effectively implemented and produce real results. And under the leadership of the Party Central Committee, our Discipline Inspection Commission has adopted a decision and the principles regarding intra-party political activities in the new era and uh, implementing the principles of party institutions and uh, to ensure that political activities are carried out in earnest and to ensure that uh, there can be sound political ecosystem. And this has also helped ensure that uh, people who are disloyal, who engage in double dealing and duplicity, 
who do not implement party decisions in earnest, who commit corruption violations, will be held accountable. And this is to ensure party unity and the authority and the centralized unified leadership of the party central committee. And third, we have ensured that we can ensure sound party conduct, we can strengthen party discipline and uh, fight corruption so that we can remove what we call the viruses that attack the party's health. So since the 18th Party National Congress, we have been able to achieve a sweeping victory in anti-corruption. The key reason is that General Secretary Xi Jinping has required us that all members of the party will not dare, will not be able, and will have no desire to be corrupt, and that we must make coordinated and unified efforts in this endeavor. And our result is that we have addressed both the symptoms and the root causes of corruption, and this is a result of our systemic effort. That is what has made achievement in this area possible. First of all, in terms of party conduct, just a few days after the conclusion of the 18th National Party Congress, the 15th of November, at the first plenum of the 19th Central Committee, and uh, just in a few days after that, the eight-point decision on party conduct was adopted. And according to General Secretary Xi Jinping, this was a crucial step that got all sectors of the party moving in improving party conduct. And General Secretary Xi Jinping has been leading by example and has made tireless efforts to ensure that the party can present a golden name card in ensuring sound party conduct and the discipline. And uh, efforts have been made in a sustained and strenuous way for people using public funds to engage in tourism, to hold conferences and entertainment activities, and to send briberies. We have addressed all of those problems one by one with concrete efforts. Year after year, we have been endeavoring to address those problems. And uh, up till now, for 93 months in a row, our commission has published reports on how we have addressed violations against the eight-point decision. And for the Central Committee itself, it has also avoided bureaucratism and formalities for formality's sake for those that only shout slogans and uh, do not earnestly or seriously implement party decisions for those having the wrong type of awareness of building vanity projects of those who respond to party inspection and examinations with only paperwork, not concrete actions. We have address those issues head on to ensure that the people feel happy and secure about what the party is doing for them so that with real efforts we can uphold social equity and justice. And also, party discipline is very important for ensuring sound party conduct. And under the leadership of the Party Central Committee, discipline building has become a part and parcel of party building. Following 18th and 19th Party National Congresses, we have twice amended the discipline action provisions so that by managing the crucial feel, we have been able to implement disciplinary regulations across the party, and we have been specifically highlighting the importance of strict discipline. We have addressed problems in their nascent stage, and we have addressed party officials in using their special resources to seek their self-interests. And we have addressed the issues of the relatives of party officials, like spouses and uh, children in running businesses, and we have cleared the thought that people can use their privileges to engage in unjustified and criminal behavior. So we have fully consolidated the sweeping victory of anti-corruption, and following the 18th Party National Congress, the party has taken drastic measures to hold those corrupt accountable. 
and we have demonstrated strong determination to fight corruption. We have fought tigers and flies, so to speak. And under the strong leadership of the Party Central Committee, our commission, since the 18th National Party Congress, has investigated 453 party officials under central authority and using four forms of oversight, we have reprimanded, educated, and uh, sanctioned 8.834 million people. We have handled 626.5 thousand violations against the eight-point decision, and we have handled 322,000 people in violation of uh, the rule against formalities for formality's sake, and we have addressed more than 390,000 cases harming people's interests and uh, handled 359,000 people. We have handled 280,000 cases involving 188,000 people in poverty reduction related cases and we have addressed 93,000 cases involving 84,000 people in addressing gangs and ringleaders engaged in criminal activities. So you see in the entire history of the Chinese nation this has been a rare case, such strong determination, and uh, this is a new chapter of anti-corruption in the party's history. And also, we have strengthened the oversight system of the party and the state. So punishment is really a means towards an end, that is, to improve and enhance the party's governance. So under the leadership of the Central Party Committee, what we want is to have full coverage in oversight and discipline inspection to strengthen the institutions to ensure that uh, there is effective oversight and constraints over the power of officials and we can have interconnected mechanisms and institutions towards this endeavor. Since the 18th National Party Congress, we have been firm in our determination to govern the party well, and we have addressed problems that were thought impossible to address for many years. We have addressed long-standing issues that were thought impossible many years ago, and we have strengthened the party's organization, conduct, and health. And uh, by the end of last year, according to a survey of the National Statistics Bureau, 95.8 percent of the Chinese people were full of confidence of the party's result in anti-corruption. That was 16.5 percentage points higher than the survey done in 2012. So our party has been able to found a way towards self-reform, self-improvement to ensure progress and the purity of itself. Thank you. Thank you. With Nikkei, in terms of GDP growth, China has bounced back to pre-COVID level. But uh, employment, uh, income, and cons consumption remain weak in the latter half of this year to boost recovery in the household sector. What measures will the country take? Minister Han, please. Under the strong leadership of the CPC Central Committee with Comrade Xi Jinping at the core, China is coordinating COVID response as well as economic and social development. We have made important progress. Last year, China's economy grew by 2.3 percent, making it the only major economy featuring positive growth last year. In the first uh, quarter, China's economy grew by 18.3 percent on a recovery basis. It was mainly the result of last year's low base numbers from services, uh, investment, exports, 
the economy continues to grow with a stronger indigenous uh, force for growth. The surveyed unemployment rate was 5% in May, which was lower than the pre-COVID level in 2019. At the same time, we can see that across different sectors and businesses, the recovery remains unimbalanced. On transport uh, and tourism, the recovery uh, is lagging behind, and SMEs still face strong, uh, a lot of challenges. Going forward, we will continue to promote progress while maintaining stability. Alongside COVID-19 response, we will continue to uh, implement the proactive fiscal policy and prudent monetary policy, maintain the continuity and sustainability of our policies, and make them more targeted. We will step up support for SMEs, focus on domestic demand, particularly the recovery of consumption. We will put employment first consolidate and expand the progress in poverty alleviation, improve the social security network, and uh, aim for continued expansion of domestic demand uh, based on the uh, growth of income of residents. We will continue to ensure employment, improve people's well-being, and uh, form a pattern of reinforcing effects of growth uh, consumption and employment. At the same time, we will strengthen international macro coordination and work together for global recovery and the stability and the un unimpeded op operation of the global supply and industrial chains. We're convinced that the balanced, sustainable, and coordinated recovery of the Chinese economy is going to be expected, delivering more benefits to the Chinese people. It will also contribute to global economic recovery. Thank you. Next question. Thank you. With Economic Daily, since the founding of the People's Republic of China, particularly after reform and open up, the private sector has been developing robustly and achieved and come a long way. How do you see the role and contribution of the private sector in the development of the economy. Thank you. Thank you for your interest in the private sector. As we all know, the private sector is the important economic foundation for upholding and developing socialism with Chinese characteristics. The CPC Central Committee attaches great importance to the private sector. On November the 1st, 2018, General Secretary Xi Jinping pointed out at the seminar with the private sector that private companies and entrepreneurs are our own people. They're one of us. And that really resonated all the private businesses people at the seminar and around the country. General Secretary Xi also made important remarks on multiple occasions about promoting sound development of the private sector and the growth of those working in the sector. He stressed the need to never waver in cementing and developing the public sector and encouraging, supporting and guiding the development of the non-public sector. So this is what we often emphasize to sound development and to never wavering. On promoting the sound development of the private sector, the State Council and local governments at all levels have introduced a series of policy measures to foster an enabling policy, legal, market, and a social environment for the private sector. And a lot has been done to protect their legitimate rights and interests in accordance with the law. On promoting the growth of those working in the private sector, the policies of trust, solidarity, service, guidance, and education must be fully implemented to encourage patriotism, professionalism, innovation, respect for the rule of law, credibility and contribution from those working in the private sector so that they could also contribute their share to socialism with Chinese characteristics. 
since reform and opening up under the support of the party and the government, the private sector has been growing and flourishing and it has played an irreplaceable role in advancing development, improving people's well-being, spurring innovation, deepening reform and expanding opening up. The role of the private sector is best explained in the following figures. It contributes to over 50% of the tax revenues, over 60% of the GDP, more than 70% of the technological innovations, and Huawei is a very good case in point. Over 80% of the urban jobs and more than 90% of businesses in China also come from the private sector. By the end of 2020, there were 40 million private companies in China with a clear increase in the overall scale and quality of the Chinese firms listed among the world's top 500. And we are delighted to see that while promoting their own development, private businesses are also giving back to the society. And I can share with you some statistics. In September 2015, the All-China Federation of Industry and Commerce, the State Council Poverty Alleviation Office and the China Society for Promotion of the Guangzhou Program jointly launched a targeted poverty reduction campaign pairing more than 10,000 private companies with over 10,000 poor villages. By the end of 2020, 127,000 private companies have helped lift 139,000 villages out of poverty. With industrial investment of 110.59 billion yuan and public good investment of 16.86 billion yuan, more than 900,000 people landed jobs thanks to this campaign, which helped create opportunities and benefits for over 18 million people registered as living in poverty. And also in the fight against COVID-19, the private sector donated altogether 17.2 billion yuan, accounting for about 60% of all the donations from the society. In addition to the 11.9 billion yuan of supplies it also donated, the private sector in response to the call of the party, also carried out the production and delivery of anti-epidemic supplies, resumed business in an orderly manner, and contributed their share to the coordinated efforts for COVID response and economic and social development. Thank you. Thank you with China News Service. Reports show a 90% approval rating for the party's anti-corruption work. Just now, Secretary Xiao mentioned twice that overwhelming uh, victory was uh, achieved in anti-corruption work, which was also uh, mentioned in the fifth plenary session of the 19th Central Committee on Discipline Inspection. So what are the specific information in this area? Thank you. The fight against corruption must achieve a sweeping victory. This is a strategic uh, goal put forward in the 19th National Party Congress. And according to the sixth requirement of Section 3 of the Congress report, it says that we must achieve and uh, consolidate the sweeping victory of anti-corruption. This was also an important judgment passed by General Secretary Xi Jinping at the relevant party meeting. So we have doubled our effort to ensure that there can be a sweeping 
victory against corruption, it requires whole of the party approach. The entire party must step up to the responsibility of anti-corruption. We have achieved this. This has come into shape. So anti-corruption under the leadership of the party central committee has become endeavor where there is zero no-go zones, there is full coverage, and there is zero tolerance. And uh, we can see that there is strong deterrence, and uh, every case discovered is dealt with. This has become the new normal. This is what a sweeping victory means. And we have established a situation in which party members do not dare and are not able to and do not desire to be corrupt. We have put in place the institutions and the mechanisms needed for this. At the second plenum of the 18th Discipline Inspection Commission, General Secretary Xi Jinping said that we must be firmly committed to anti-corruption. This is a show of strength of our party. Whoever it is, no matter what kind of high rank he Holds, as long as he is in violation of party discipline and uh, the country's laws, he must be held accountable and brought to justice. This is not an empty promise. The Central Committee of the party has kept its words and taken firm actions throughout the past eight years. General Secretary Xi Jinping has led us on many important new struggles, and anti-corruption is an important battle of it. And uh, this is also part of our uh, self-reform and uh, strong and uh, strict party governance. This is a tough battle. Throughout the past eight years, General Secretary Xi Jinping has told the party time and again that corruption has the biggest detriment to the party's governance. It is most harmful, and the corruption is the easiest way to overthrow a party governing the country. So anti-corruption is a battle that we cannot afford and must not lose. So as General Secretary Xi said, public support is the biggest politics. If we don't handle the thousands of corrupt officials, we would be losing our confidence in the 1.4 billion people. So in uniting the party and the whole country, anti-corruption is of crucial importance. That is why we have engaged in this struggle. We have the right theories and set the right goals and taken the right actions and achieved the right results in this endeavor. We have established the system and the institutions under the centralized and unified leadership of the party central committee. And we have seen the coordinated efforts among party committees and the discipline inspection and supervisory commissions have also carried out organization work together and uh, people are supportive of this endeavor and at different levels of party committees we have seen responsibilities being fulfilled and the party central committee has been deepening the reform of the supervisory system so they have integrated the reforms of the discipline inspection and the supervisory systems and uh, it has established the national supervision commission and uh, such commissions at different levels we have pulled strength and resources from various levels and across the country to engage in anti-corruption, and this has strengthened the party's all-round and uh, full-process leadership of anti-corruption endeavors. And also, we have s established the principles in anti-corruption, the three commitments, according to the report of the 19th Party Central Committee, Party Central Congress. Uh, we have kept the pressure up. We have focused on deterring and curbing corruptions. We have investigated people both offering and receiving bribes. This has played a strong role in deterring corruption activities. And we have kept a close eye on key individuals and the key areas, those who have refused to stop violations and those 
who have received complaints from the people most, and also we have focused on financial, state-owned enterprises, judicial, education, healthcare areas. We have kept a close eye on corruption cases close to the people, and also the cases which harm people's interests. We have also kept a close eye on corruption concerning people's livelihoods and also in protecting the environment, in financial platforms, in financial risks related areas. We have had taken strong actions to deter and investigate corruption cases and also we have taken coordinated and unified actions to ensure that people do not want to and do not dare to be corrupt. This is an important aspect of full and strict party governance. After the 18th Party National Congress, one of the priorities established was to fight corruption. So we have focused on addressing the symptoms to win time for addressing the root causes and to deepen reforms. And after the 19th National Party Congress, Young Secretary Xi Jinping has said that there should be no stop to fight corruption and an integrated approach should be adopted to deepen those efforts. So fundamentally, people must not dare to be corrupt. This is the precondition for anti-corruption struggles. And the, kush, the key is to enhance institutions, supervision, reform, and uh, to remove institutional barriers so that people will not be able to be corrupt. And also, a very important part of this endeavor is to make sure that the people do not have the desire to be corrupt. So this has become a lifelong task for all party members so that we have effective ways to prevent people from being corrupt. And uh, what we have achieved is that party members now do not dare to be corrupt out of reverence for the rules and they cannot be corrupt because the institutions bar them from doing so and they have uh, gained the awareness of not having the desire to be corrupt. And uh, so far we have investigated 3.8 million cases of corruption and we have handled 4.08 million people. So you can see the extent to which we have carried out this fight against corruption. And we have given disciplinary and administrative punishment to 3.742 million people. And uh, since the 19th Party National Congress, because of the right policy and actions we have taken, there are people who have uh, voluntarily approached the authorities to turn themselves in, and there are 42,000 people who have done so. And in tw since 2014, we have engaged in a sky night operation, and we have brought back corrupt officials at large, altogether 9,165 of them from over 120 countries and 2,408 of them are party members and uh, state functionaries. We have recovered 21.739 billion RMB yuan of illegal proceeds from those cases, and we have uh, brought back 60 from the most wanted list. And also we have strengthened the rule of law at the second plenum of the 18th Discipline Inspection Commission. Eight years ago, General Secretary Xi Jinping emphasized the need to enhance the rule of law to support the fight against corruption. So we have revised the anti-corruption law, the constitution, and also we have formulated legislation on supervision, on administrative punishment, on the criminal code, and so on. So all these efforts are a response to people's call, and we have purified the party, and we have truly fought a war that has won the support of the people. This has been an extraordinary and massively effective fight, and we have successfully embarked on the path 
and the path that relies on the party's leadership, that relies on the socialism based rule of law with Chinese characteristics to address corruption. Thank you. Thank you with Macau Daily. It was just now mentioned that the CPC maintains regular contact with over 560 political parties and organizations from 160 countries. So my question is, going forward, in the CPC's external work, what role will it play? Thank you. Thank you for your question. In fact, in the opening remarks, I have already given a brief overview of the role of the party's external work in its revolution, development, and reform. And to answer your question, I will focus on the period since 2012. The party held its 18th National Congress, and as we move into the new era, in this new era, the CPC has put forth new requirements for the external relations work. And we need to play new roles in this new era. First, we need to fulfill our role in serving as an important front of the party. We will focus on serving the major decisions of the CPC Central Committee and the decisions of the General Secretary Xi and shoulder our political responsibilities, practice to uphold and work to resolve the negative factors in the external environment to cement the foundation of the CPC and carry out studies on some major theoretical issues and practices and serve as a good advisor of the party and also carry out political and public diplomacy to promote and tell the story of the CPC. Second, we should also further play our role in enhancing the CPC's international influence, appeal, and power to shape. We have actively responded to the concerns from the international community, and we have held 14 meetings and seminars on promoting the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics. We also held more than 160 online events on this matter. And this year, in light of the COVID situation and the COVID safety protocols, we also held more than 150 online and offline events focused on innovative green development, poverty reduction, and the implementation of our national blueprint to help the international community gain a more in-depth and accurate understanding of the original aspirations and missions of the CPC so that they would have a comprehensive understanding of the path, experience, and the theories of the CPC, and they would have the right understanding and perspective of China and the CPC. Third, we would also further play our role in help building a new type of political party relations and serving the major country diplomacy with Chinese characteristics. In the spirit of mutual respect and mutual learning, our department has been actively developing our relations with other political parties. For example, we have stepped up our contacts with the political parties with Cuba, Vietnam, and other socialist countries to cement the foundation of our political relations. We have also stepped up our contacts and relations with the political parties with other major countries, our neighbors, and uh, other developing countries. We are also committed to building a network of 
political party relations to cement support for the work for the external work of the CPC. So far, we have established and maintained frequent contacts with 544 political parties and 16 political organizations from 164 countries. And about 160 of those political parties are ruling parties, and some are participatory parties. And also, there are two, about 200 political parties who have major influence in their political life. So the CPC has been expanding its circle of friends, and we have a lot to look forward to in the future. And fourth, we will further play our role in helping build a moderately prosperous society in all respects and contributing to the great renewal of the Chinese nation. We are committed to building consensus deepening exchanges, expanding the scope of our cooperation, and contributing to the fostering of a new development paradigm. We have overcome the impact of COVID-19 and worked to take care of the needs of the different localities and regions in China. And we have introduced uh, a new initiatives for political party exchanges, which cover uh, almost all the provinces in China, except um, Taiwan province. And also the fifth, we will play a greater role in help building a community with a shared future for mankind, upholding world peace, promoting common development, safeguarding equity and justice, and demonstrating the sense of responsibility of our nation and our party. And we have contributed to the building of a new type of international relations and uh, the principles of consultation and collaboration for shared benefits in reforming the global governance system. We have worked with other major Belt and Road Initiative countries on political party consultative frameworks and mechanisms to help build consensus with these political parties, which will help encourage their governments to participate in Belt and Road Cooperation. We provided anti-epidemic supplies to more than 200 countries from 200 political parties from 70 countries to fight COVID-19. We also shared our experience in COVID response with other political parties. We, has, we have also encouraged our other political parties to provide assistance to more than 60 countries. And together with political parties from around the world, we made the joint call for cooperation and solidarity in the fight against COVID-19. And we also worked with more than 100 political parties, including more than um, 100 of those from the Islamic countries on rejecting uh, the violation of human rights and also in supporting the CPC's records in this area. So under the strong leadership of General Secretary Xi, as China unfolds its endeavor for building a moderately prosperous society, we will achieve even more progress in our external work. Thank you. Thank you with Phoenix TV. Our question is about the new development paradigm. General Secretary Xi Jinping uh, mentioned that we need to grasp the new development stage, implement a new development philosophy, and uh, foster a new development paradigm. What are the essence and features of the new development paradigm, and what will be its impact on China and the world economy? Thank you. To accelerate the fostering of a new development paradigm featuring domestic circulations, the mainstay and domestic international circulations reinforcing each other is an important strategic decision made by the CPC Central Committee with G General Secretary Xi Jinping at the core. 
Currently, China is leading the pack in terms of COVID response as well as economic and social recovery. China was the only major economy that secured a positive growth last year, and this year, China expected to achieve a higher growth with a recovery nature, which will further consolidate the progress of our COVID response. This means the decision on building a new development paradigm is highly targeted, forward-looking, and pioneering. It is an absolutely right decision. Its impact will continue to unfold in the future. On the essence and features of the development paradigm, I have already talked a lot about that, and let me add a few more points. First, the new development paradigm is not a domestic Cir circulation with behind closed doors. Instead, it is the dual circulations. The domestic circulation is the basic underpinning for China's sustained and sound economic development, but we can never give up international division of labor and cooperation. Instead, we need to promote high level opening up at broader ranges and uh, with the more in depth efforts. We will uh, attract uh, high-level talents, knowledge, uh, e expertise, and managerial experience to increase the quality and level of the domestic circulation. Second, the new paradigm does not focus on uh, demand side only, but instead it will focus on structural side, su uh, supply side structural reform as the main line. We need to start on both sides. While expanding domestic demand, we will focus on building a high quality and uh, efficient uh, industrial chain, supply chain, and innovation chain. We will make uh, supply and demand more compatible, uh, remove impediments in the circulation, and improve the quality, efficiency, and resilience of the supply system. Third, the new development paradigm is not a partial circulation. Instead, it is an overall circulation of the whole of the economy. It covers uh, state-owned enterprises, private enterprises, and foreign firms. They all have their places in the new uh, development paradigm. We will not opt for autarky. Instead, we will uh, focus on improving the interconnectedness of the domestic market and uh, improve the uh, grand uh, unified national market featuring a level playing field. It will be a long process of our effort to foster a new development paradigm. Domestically, it will make the development more resilient, uh, expand rooms for development, underpin high quality growth, promote people's lives, and contribute to our effort to fully build a modern socialist country. Internationally, the effort will provide countries with more market opportunities and cooperation opportunities, and add new impetus to the global economic recovery and continued growth. So it can be said that our effort to foster a new development paradigm is being advanced against the backdrop of international complexities, and it is the China solution and China contribution for economic globalization and common prosperity of all. Thank you all for the briefing, and this is the end of the second press briefing.